So welcome everybody. I sure appreciate everyone being here. Okay. That's okay. So this is a, a webinar presentation about Epic Technology, uh, our Total Water Solutions. The website's at epictws.com, and uh, that's uh, more or less our, our main site that actually right now points to you know, ECS. Dash green com, but uh, epictws.com is the uh, the main site, and uh, what uh, Epic stands for is a um, the environmental passive integrated conveyance. So there's two different products that are available. Uh, there's you know, the larger four foot chamber, and newly released this year we have the smaller uh, two foot chamber. That's uh, you know, half the width and a half the length. And so this allows for the chamber to be able to fit in tighter spaces uh, in the you know, smaller planters and urban areas, narrower uh, trenches uh, at edge of pavement for drainage applications. And, and it basically has the same drainage performance as the large chamber you know, used mostly for irrigation. So it's a new, new and improved product. Kind of kind of like uh, how Steve Jobs dropped the iPhone into a glass of water and said, see the bubbles? That's wasted space. So we, we uh, uh, increased the, the efficiency. Uh, the system itself is comprised of you know, a chamber and different pans or EPDM liner that make cells. So these cells you know, connect together by gravity, uh, similar to biology. So one cell will fill and then spill, fill and then spill in sequence. And they're all installed on a laser level plane with half inch tolerance at 90% proctor density. So even though we have a level plane, we still can be able to keep up with drainage. EPDs on lines, but no sound in mic. Okay, great. I'm glad you guys are able to tune in. We can always do chat questions as they go on. Here. Um, so the cells connect together in sequence. So a pan like this, for infiltrative reasons, could be similar to this picture we were showing earlier in the discussion uh, for rain gardens and infiltration basins, to where really the importance is to be able to have the water introduced or captured by sheet flow and filtered you know, through the EPIC system profile of gravel and sand. Uh, so by introducing water through the chambers, they all connect through the header pipe. Then the water can spread to each pan and wick up by capillary rise and then be able to infiltrate in the spaces between the pans. So this allows for the water to be cleaned prior to infiltration or going to subsequent storage that will you know, capture and use uh, you know, more water later. Uh, the other approach, if not pans, then is the EPDM liner cells. These are still EPIC cells, but they're much bigger, uh, over 100 feet long. Uh, they come in rolls of 20 by 100, so these are 18 feet wide by, you, know, you can be able to seam the liner at any distance. You know, so 98 feet long would be a typical biggest cell that we would work with if it's a 20 by 100 uh, EPDM liner roll. Um, you'll notice that we still do fold the walls upright, and this is to help contain the water so you can be able to see the progression of the water as it progresses across you know, the, uh, the field or epic area. And we'll show some other pictures of that work a little bit later. But that's just so you know that there's you know, small pans to large cells, and all is the same, all in a laser level sub. Uh, so, all the dirt that exists in the world, the different clay, silt, loam combinations. Yeah, you know, there's lots of different ratios, uh, but our exclusive choice is medium wash sand. It's a ASTM F2396-04, but then we still test it for further uh, drainage and capillary rise capabilities to make sure it'll work with the EPIC system. And the reason for that, you know, when you look at all, all those dirts and clays and, and silt combinations under a microscope, they have kind of like a platelet type formation that really compacts the spaces in between the particles very tightly uh, to the point to where not even air can move in between the soil particles. But sand particles are different. They're like miniature boulders. And so with that miniature boulder of a one millimeter diameter average, uh, you now have these void spaces that occur between the boulders. And that's what we take advantage of. That void space is crucial and key to good drainage and to an uh, aerobic uh, profile that has lots of air you know, in between the profiles for the roots to be able to breathe. This makes a very, very strong uh, you know, profile for, for plant growth. So growing plants in sand is feasible as long as there is a water source available. 
Um, and the way that we're able to make that connection from chamber to gravel to sand is the eighth one ratio. If you look at these gravel particles, they're all in contact with the air spaces between each other, but then how do we keep the sand from falling in between? Well, the sand particles are chosen so that they have contact points with the gravel. It creates a bridging layer, or in some industries known as a choking layer. So there's no geofabric required to separate the gravel from the sand layer. So it's a very fine gravel, a quarter inch minus. Uh, that'd be an ASTM C33, uh, C number 89 uh, that we uh, use in, in the systems. Now, this will vary. You know, if you have a different approved sand like we did in the Middle East, that was a smaller sand particle. So we ended up having to use a, a, a coarse sand instead of a fine gravel to be able to match that 8 to 1 ratio particle size. But the wicking of capillary rise is really the magic uh, that uh, occurs for most people when they see it for the first time. It's, it's similar to a bounty towel as it wicks water off a, a spill on the table. Uh, air pockets also do form in between those sand particles as the water wicks upward. So when you look at this uh, profile, the, the patent to the chamber is these offset holes here. You can be able to see the holes on the inside are higher than the holes on the outside. And so that's how we can be able to block with this gravity trap uh, the means from the, the sand or the, part, the gravel ever getting into the chamber. So the chamber now becomes our freeway, our path of least resistance for water to be able to travel through the connector pipes and decant as it fills and spills through each chamber. That then makes a saturated zone, about a two or three inch saturated zone at the bottom, which coincidentally is apparently what a lot of the codes are calling for, is <laughs> these type of profiles with a saturated zone and a capillary zone. So as, as the water wicks up into the capillary zone, the uh, roots are able to take from that moisture at their discretion, and they're also able to breathe at their discretion. So if you have uh, you know, a, a cactus, uh, you have very shallow roots near the top, or a strawberry or turf would have very deep roots you know, seeking out the moisture down below. But with the predictability of capillary rise over a seven-day period, you can now also have a more or less dry crown zone. So this helps uh, deter weeds from blowing in on the wind and uh, you know, germinating into the profile as easily uh, during normal operations. So it makes it for you know, more hassle-free gardening and, and, and landscape. So this is just a quick uh, video example of uh, you know, how the capillary rise works. Uh, they, they poured water into the uh, conveyance here. Now the video is not working, but you can see the image I'm assuming. No, no, it's not playing, but anyway, technical difficulties, what can we do? Uh, so there's, you can be able to see there's the two-inch gravel layer. It wicks up into the sand, and it actually goes um, against gravity all the way up 14, 15 inches above the water line. So this makes the water then available for the plants to take from. So this moisture line here is only at about six to seven hours. After a, about a day or so, it makes it all the way you know, up to the, to the top. And that video is also available on our website as well too. But here's a cross profile of the chamber. The roots do not obstruct the chamber. They, they treat it like a, you know, like a rock or an obstruction to, to go around. But they tend to uh, not block the, the holes because once they reach the saturated zone, they tend to rot and decompose away because there's no air anymore. They're underwater. And so that way they're able to uh, you know, not block the conveyance of the epic chamber, but proliferate up here in the capillary zone. And, and notice how clean the water is after being filtered, you know, coming through that aggregate uh, profile. So this is uh, the root growth after only three months. No, I do not lo any longer fit into those pants, but uh, the roots, you know, do very well. I, that's only three-month growth uh, from sand-based sod. And the watering from the top actually can damage the roots. Uh, in this comparison of bean roots side by side with sand profile, the one on the left was top watered. So you can see how it actually sheared and cut away at the roots as the one on the right was watered by Epic. And that slow movement of capillary rise allows more root hair growth and more root development, making a stronger, more prolific plant. So that's where we like to say uh, it's uh, half the plant, twice, no. <laughs> twice the plant. Half the, uh, twice the plant, half the water. I had it mixed up for my, my own little slogan there. But, uh, half, the, half the water, twice the plant. And that's due to the afro root, as I call it, the expanded uh, root zone that develops. Very important picture. This is also on our website here, too, under products. 
Uh, so this can then lead to uh, small uh, conversion uh, kits, uh, planters. These could be applicable you know, on even on patios or you know, high-rise apartments to where the roof downspouts can then incorporate into small planters, even if there's a very small area. But even here in the desert in Reno, Nevada, uh, we only water that once per week in 100-degree heat in August, and it's still enough to keep the plants happy. Uh, you know, raised garden beds also be able to apply you know, for agriculture or for you know, decorative flowers. But basically all the landscape can all be existing in Epic. In this backyard, the, uh, underneath the pavers, the turf grass, the flowers, the shrubs, the trees, they're all growing within a 14-inch uh, sand profile. And the roots just simply spread out laterally to accommodate uh, the best growing conditions for the species. And uh, you can even be, like I said, a base underneath the pavers as well, too. So this makes it very easy for the client for construction because now instead of many different complex slopes and gradients, now you can just have one level pad for the whole backyard and let the landscape architect design what goes on the surface. But then you have the, the same common you know, base for the water management underneath. So here's how it looks and how it works. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this before, but you know, I want to just go ahead and review. Uh, the chambers are connected by a, a two-inch connector. Uh, in this case, you can be able to see there's kind of a common uh, pipe or a header pipe that they all connect to, and they're resting on top of the 45 mil Firestone EPDM liner. Uh, and also notice how the roof downspout is connected you know, to the chambers as well. The sandbags are just holding them in place so they don't shift uh, you know, during installation. And you can see there's a slot uh, in here in the uh, drain pipe, so that's the final overflow uh, once the entire cell fills up. And so that cell then is reusing this roof uh, area as the irrigation source to reuse that roof water for the bicycle parking for the food co-op. This is in Minneapolis. And there was one time where they had a drought. Uh, they simply just put a garden hose down that same pipe, you know, for once a week until you know, it was fully charged and the grass stayed happy. Um, but really there's no, you know, exposed drip lines, no sprinkler heads, nothing for animals to chew on or people to trip over. It's all a nice laser level finished grade surface. Uh, so the way it operates in this case, there's a small vault, about five gallons is the smallest, that you can be able to connect a, a small pump about the size of your fist, maybe a 16th or a 32nd horsepower pump. That's set to an electrical timer to kick on once per week and recirculate the water up to the you know, tall grasses, down to the turf, and then drain back to the vault. So that's one of these pipes here. When it rains a lot, you know, there's a second uh, overflow drain that then drains to the outfall of the property down a little bit lower there. So you do always have an out. It doesn't necessarily always have to be a closed system. Um, but we're able to capture and hold two and a half gallons per square foot in that turf area. So this is acting as a stormwater retention in, in the landscape. And then for adding nutrients, you can be able to just add you know, the fertilizer or, or organic nutrients directly to the irrigation water in the vault as it's recirculating and subsurface recirculate. Now, you can add it to the surface like you normally would, too. It'll just dissolve into the sand. But this gives just a second option to maintenance to you know, help uh, give more you know, different options for them to be able to maintain these uh, landscapes. Well, any size or shape can be accommodated. Uh, the only thing is all the roof downspouts directed towards the system. All the sheet flow directed towards the system. This is now your stormwater retention. So there's no longer a need for a storm pit or an infiltration basin. Now the landscape itself it serves that function, holding the two and a half gallons per square foot. Uh, in this case in Palo Alto, you know, they have a cistern underneath the epic area, about 30,000 gallons, that they capture all the roof runoff from the planter areas and the roof areas and divert it underneath this turf area. So they're able to be sustainable simply from capturing and reusing their stormwater, and they don't need sprinklers or drip in that particular area. This is the same installation in Palo Alto, the Netflix. Uh, no, this is the guy, the Netflix guy. This is the Cisco Systems Executive uh, in Palo Alto, uh, California. Uh, but not just turf can be able to grow in Epic. Uh, trees, shrubs, plants, like I showed before, this Chinese maple was a one-inch caliper when it was planted in the year 2000. It's almost 20 years ago. <laughs> By 2007, it reached on nearly a seven-inch caliper and uh, you know, was uh, quite tall. Uh, you can be able to see how it just expanded and grew in that 14-inch you know, profile. Here it is last year, so nearly you know, 17 years old in this case, and the tree is still proliferating in that sand profile. 13 inches deep. It was 13, 14 inches deep at that time. Right? So uh, if you want to plant larger plants, there are options available. 
So you can be able to see you can uh, make a slightly deeper profile to accommodate the larger root ball. This is one approach. Uh, this was done here in this installation where you can be able to see it actually makes kind of a nice sitting area around the tree as you have a slightly deeper area to accommodate that, that, that root ball. Uh, the other option is to plant the trees adjacent to the system. So in this case, the pans, you'll be able to see the tree is right next to it. So the capillary movement can wick the water up over the wall and into the existing tree's root zone or, or planted tree's root zone. And this is at the TCF Stadium in Minnesota. And these are the trees about four years later. And as we had an interesting visit where you know, of all of this turf area in the epic, uh, after a rainstorm, you don't see any runoff you know, going across the, uh, the sidewalk. I think over here, that's just a little bit from the sprinklers. That was near some of the other trees there. But oh, that's the, okay. The sidewalk is tilted towards it, so that's what's left as it went you know, into the system. But other areas around the campus that don't have epic, you see the runoff going across the sidewalk. Uh, this is the installation in Vista del Lago. Uh, this was installed before we were using EPDM liners. That's why it's the pans on top of the visque, and they wanted to be able to still conserve every drop. But notice how it's the purple pipe. So we were using recycled water to irrigate this entire soccer field. Uh, there's a 3,000-gallon cistern over by the maintenance field here that has the electrical timer on the building and a third horsepower pump that then pumps water to the inlet header across the field that drains all the way to a drain header that goes back to the pump. So then it just recirculates. So there you can be able to see as the water is wicking to the surface, as it comes across the field slowly, laser level field, no crown. You can still see the Nike swoosh on the players on the uh, other sideline across the way. We... Uh, Drill seeded uh, with a Kentucky bluegrass, and it had germination within eight days. Uh, here it is at 20 days. Edge-to-edge uh, -edge germination, no hot spots whatsoever, even though it's a wind-prone area. Uh, being that, we're wicking from underneath. There's no surface watering taking place. Uh, here it is at 45 days, with about four to six inch root growth and ready for its first haircut. And at 90 days from seed, it was ready for play. Uh, and then here's the uh, same field uh, about seven years later. Now, the interesting thing with the, this type of approach is using recycled water. So the, you know, the water connection fees are dramatically reduced. Uh, for sprinklers, at least here on the West Coast, uh, it's a three-inch connection in that town in Rockland uh, was uh, $750,000. We were able to reduce that to a one-inch water connection, which is only fifty grand. So we saved the client $700,000 right out of the gate before the field was even built simply by requiring a smaller water connection fee. So this, I think, could be a key element uh, to uh, savings for clients uh, when considering large park and large field areas that may require you know, large amounts of water. But you won't, you know, if you deal with the garden hose, with epic. So uh, just one of the points for what, for savings there. And, and the other point to look at is the quality of the turf. So here's the uh, soccer field here at the Vista del Lago High School. And notice the uh, the ball fields. So we didn't get that contract. This went to the sprinkler guys. But uh, very windy up there, lots of wind pattern loss. Yeah, the main stadium is a synthetic turf, so uh, you can be able to see uh, how good the quality is with the, with the wind pattern loss there, that sort of thing. Another field we're really proud of, and uh, you can look at it from the satellite, is at SMU in uh, Dallas, Texas. It's a hurricane-proof field, I like to call it, uh, because it can be able to take you know, large amounts of drainage and still be a playable field. Uh, here it is after a major storm. They're still able to practice their soccer I think it was after an eight-inch rain event or something like that. All the other fields were flooded in the town, but they're still able to play here. Consequently, to be uh, applicable towards you know, the, the climate change mantra and that sort of thing, uh, here's the same field uh, during Texas uh, drought back in 2011. This is the 100th day of temperatures over 100 degrees. So, you know, the turf just compensates. It's in the profile. They can take that extra water and transpire it as needed to be able to maintain healthy growth. So whether it rains too much or rains too little, you know, Epic can still be the the, you know, the the quality conveyance of the water to be able to you know, have premium landscapes. But a lot of that is due to the maintenance too. You can't just install Epic. you got to take care of it. It's not worth having if it's not worth taking care of. So one of those is key is uh, core aeration, to be able to punch through the thatch layer that develops uh, you know, as the grass you know, grows. So you have to be able to punch those holes through every season and that gives you the opportunity to be able to add nutrients and balance out your profile. Uh, you have to make sure that you know, the mower blades get a nice sharp cut so you don't you know, rip or tear at the, at the grass blades, which makes them susceptible to airborne diseases that can you know, float in on the breeze and that sort of thing. And you have to operate the system correctly. If Epic's low flow. Yeah, it's low tech, low flow. So if you operate it too quickly, 
you can reach the drain and go, oh, yeah, it's filled, but you didn't give it enough time to fill the whole cell. That's why we recommend one gallon per minute per chamber row. And that slow trickle, that low flow at you know, 24 hours once a week will then give enough time to fill the entire cell and spread throughout the entire area. Uh, the other aspect is uh, nutrient balance. We highly, highly recommend uh, getting agricultural tests at these uh, different facilities. It's the same thing that golf courses and professional sports uh, fields do. Uh, you, you send in the sample of the sand or soil to the lab. Uh, it's like 45, 50 bucks. And they'll give you a full report of all the nutrients that exist in the profile and then the nutrients you need to add. You know, and the essential nutrients are these eight here. Uh, this is the... Uh, determined from uh, Hoagland uh, and from Stanford in 1938. He grew a bunch of different plants to their optimum, picked the one that looked the absolute best, burnt it down and analyzed the ashes. And that's how he came up with determining you know, the calcium, iron, and the, all the different uh, nutrients that are required for the ultimate plant growth. It's called the Hoagland Solution. And you can look that up on Wikipedia. And we have you know, more information on it as well, too, because each nutrient has a specific function. So if you lack in one of them, yeah, you know, you, the turf or landscape, you know, will not do as well. But, uh, and sometimes dirty water can be your irrigation source. The nutrients are already in it. This is a West Side Park in Los Angeles uh, that was uh, using this uh, particular uh, drainage cauldron, uh, Bologna Creek, as the irrigation source, acting as a filter for the city of Los Angeles. So uh, the system was installed on bench topography. The civil wanted to be able to keep the existing uh, site slope. So Instead of a laser level area, they did laser level benches following the topography. We just serpentine the flow pattern from high point to low point. Uh, there was a very large existing tree there as well, too, that we were able to wick the water up and over the, the wall into the uh, existing tree's root zone. And this allowed it to be able to you know, be irrigated from the adjoining epic system as well, too. Uh, so that, yeah, that park was a collaboration between you know, the uh, the sanitation, uh, parks and rec, and also uh, water and power, since it's using the land underneath their power lines. But it was a, a community solution to you know, use that vacant land underneath. So they did uh, over-engineer some of the aspects of that. They put in, I think, too large of a pump that then failed on them, that sort of thing. Nothing that was Epic's fault, but you know, if you talk to some of the folks in Los Angeles, you know, some of them were frustrated with parts of the project maintenance because you know, the parks and rec didn't aerate as they should. And the, the pump was too big, you know, so there are some issues that came up, but there are some good uh, results that they got from the testing from that as well, too. Uh, they found a 97% reduction in bacteria that was removed from that dirty water we showed you uh, as a result of passing through the Epic filter. Uh, another project that's a very a nice example is the Cambria project uh, that was in 2004 on the central coast of California, uh, right near the ocean, but it was up on a hill. And so they couldn't provide enough water pressure to irrigate, so they ended up irrigating with Epic instead. So they captured the sheet flow, uh, and all the roof down spots are connected to the system. So here's at this corner uh, after installation. Here it is uh, 11 years later. So you can still see it. You know, it's, a, it's a sustainable system that can be able, you know, last through the ages. Uh, and there's that same corner down there. And so what they did is all the parking lot areas, all the rooftop areas, the play areas, they're all harvested, all the surface areas, down to the lowest section of the, of the campus, where underneath the uh, main field, they had 2 million gallons, well, 1.7 million gallons of storage. And this is in the ADS N12 uh, five foot diameter pipes uh, underneath the field. And so they're able to capture the winter rains to reuse for summer irrigation. So here we are installing the epic field over that reservoir. Uh, for large installations like this, we recommend using a, a telebelt like system. So you simply are loading sand or gravel into the hopper, and then uh, there's this guy here who's operating by remote control to swing that arm. I think it has a 100 foot, 150 yeah. foot reach or something. 130 foot reach. Um, so, and there's you know, videos on our website that show this uh, being used as examples too. So this is a very efficient way to uh, install the aggregate uh, you know, in large installations. But essentially, Cambria was given free water forever. I, I think they did uh, connect the water pressure to it, but it's on a meter, and they've never used any water. It's a $7 million water connection or something like that that we're able to help save them um, for that installation. Uh, other installations that are applicable is uh, your green roof installation. So this one's in Minneapolis. This was awarded uh, Architecture Magazine's Home of the Year in 2003, on uh, the 10th floor of this uh, you know, building that they revamped in uh, Minneapolis there. And the interesting thing with that is that we, like, we have a mantra we like to say that zero-scaping wastes water. 
And that may come to a shock to some of you, um, but it, but it's true. When you when you do the math, the, the xeroscaping really can waste water in the big picture of things, because uh, you you take a look at the cooling degree days and, and how plants transpire and create cooler air. So a typical air conditioner in the United States and the Western United States, they'll use about 3,300, 3,400 kilowatt uh, hours per year, given you know the cooling degree days of say a 90 degree temperature. Now if you have a lot of landscape outside. Oh, what's going on? What can be able to happen is that the temperature can be able to reduce. Oh, I see. I clicked on a link by accident. <laughs> Let's go back to my presentation here. Another technical difficulty. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. So if, if you have lots of landscaping and green wall, what can happen is that the extra transpiration, there's a study done in Phoenix that actually it lowers the outside temperature by up to 10 degrees due to the vegetated areas around the building. And so this could be a great way to be able to fight you know, what the, you know, the, the heat island effect, the urban heat island effect. And so now, instead of a 90 degree temperature, now you can be able to have an 80 degree temperature. This reduce the, reduces the cooling degree days, and now you can be able to save electrical savings of over a thousand kilowatt hours per year. Now, the reason I say zero scaping waste water, well, where does that you know, thousand kilowatt hours come from? If it comes from the, like a hydroelectric area like Cooper Dam, that it takes a, a large amount of uh, volume of water to create a kilowatt hour of electricity. I think the equation uh, equates to um, zero scaping may save a hundred thousand gallons in landscape use, but you're going to use 800,000 gallons more to create the extra power to run the air conditioning. So, that's how xeroscaping can, in fact, waste water. So it makes more sense just to have more landscapes with efficient uh, irrigation like Epic. Now, this is the, one of the first lead platinum homes in the USA in Santa Monica, a green roof that was applied with Epic. This is a rooftop construction. Now, this is a retrofit, so they already had a slope to it. So we simply have the upright walls in strategic locations. You can see how the water pools up against the wall. So this is the water pools enough to still get contact with the high portion so it might be three inches here and one inch is there, but it's still enough to be able to wick the water up. And here they are installing the sand and installing the sod, and that's the, you know, the finished green roof. And then after its second year of growth, you can be able to see you're making a park. And so all the condos actually sold out on the side facing the green roof because they had a nice you know park to look at outside their condo instead of the industrial area on the other side of the condo, which you know, took a while longer to sell out. So uh, this is another installation done by our, our Distributor down in Los Angeles from LID Incorporated. Uh, this is the Da Vinci Project in Los Angeles. It's a fifth floor uh, podium uh, green roof. So you can be able to see the larger trees are going where the the, the orange uh, square is here, and that's how they're able to plant the root ball and still be able to keep it within. I think it was a, a 20 inch deep planter in, in this case. But those are you know ten thousand dollar palm trees that they're you know lowering down, and uh, you know the landscape arts that had some concern, but they they were growing in quite well and, and looking good. And it's uh, going now in its third year. So really, all in all, we can confidently say there is no water crisis. We just need to look at how we're doing things. What is what is it that we're doing that's wasting so much water? Well, it's there's a lot of runoff waste from sprinklers. It runs off and goes down the drain. Uh, you know, pressurized breaks that typically happen on Friday you know, afternoon, but when everyone's going home, it gets your car all wet. Uh, watering where things just don't grow. The the, the wind pattern loss uh, from you know, the wind blowing over the concretes and such. And most importantly, especially to you guys there on the East Coast, is the infiltration basins, these storm ponds. You know, they're a waste of real estate space. They uh, are conducive to uh, vector issues and spreading West Nile virus and disease through mosquitoes. And, and most importantly for the client, it's a waste of space. If you're using a valuable real estate that could have been more homes, could have been a Starbucks, could have been, you know, whatever you know, it is the client's building. So... That's where it's the really poor performance. And it can be an expensive infrastructure. You have large pipes used. You have deep trenches. Uh, you know, Hemet, California paid over $4 million bucks to extend their drainage capacity a mile. So the answer has always been build it bigger. Oh, we, we, under, we, we miscalculated. we got to put more drainage in. And, and our, our philosophy is to you know, build these epic storm sponges that can be able to help maintain the big flows before they become this big. Uh, so you look at curb and gutter, even though they're zero skipping the rock, you still pick up a lot of the sediments that can overwhelm a, a, a system. Even in a one-inch rain event, this was taken in Reno. Uh, our philosophy is instead of that catch basin, which is about three square feet of openings on the side, 
What if you had uh, pavers on the in the in the gutter? And this is was applied at Modesto Veterinary Hospital. That's over 20 square feet of openings if you count all the cracks in between all the porous pavers. Now there's you know there's porous concrete. There's uh, you know other different pavers, but all of the sheet flow from the area is captured directly to the edge. And so that's uh, our well, and then yeah, then stored underneath. That's yeah, that's the next slide here. So underneath the parking lot is a 300,000 gallon cistern that they're using for all the landscape, the green roof uh, of the entire facility. We even have a septic application on the other side of this building. Also, they've tapped into the uh, the cistern to be able to run a, a geothermal cooling through the walls of the building. So taking advantage of the natural cooling effects of the earth, kind of like being in a cave where it's typically, you know, 55, 60 degrees, that helps cool the water as it sits underneath the earth. So now we can be able to recirculate that, you know, that cool water through the walls of the building. It's enough to help heat it in the winter above freezing, but it's also helps cool it in the summer when the temperatures are over 80 degrees outside. So it's a, another feature that can be able to help you know, get lead points and, and just help you a, a logical way to uh, you know, build these buildings. So the, the numbers are all to the engineers. You know, the, you know the infiltration rate of the pavers. Uh, we know that you know, the transpiration rates uh, through the turf, you know, anywhere from 0.1 to 0.15 gallons per square foot per day, depending on your climate and your ecosystem that you're near. Uh, the storage capacity in the sand is an average of you know, 2.5, 2.6 gallons per square foot per day. And we know the you know, the rate of, through the connector pipe is 20 gallons per minute. So the numbers can be plugged for the engineers to do these new hydrological models. But the, the basic concept that we're trying to convey here is that you have your collection surface we just need to add the filtration before it goes into storage. And that way you have a, a greater sense of the hydrological responsibility and not being caught with your pants down if you get too much water coming in at once. And you can really have a siphoning type system here. And what that is, is one, that siphon can be at a different elevation. But once the water fills to a certain elevation, you can then siphon it down to a desired elevation. And that makes you ready with a volume prepared for the next storm that might be coming in the next week or so during different events. So this particular model, I think, especially applies to you guys there on the East Coast, to where you know, these siphon systems can then release the storm over two or three days instead of all at once. And, and it's a nice filtered, slow release, but you still have accommodations ready for the next storm coming in. Um, you know, but then you, you're capturing sheet flow you know, from the edge of the pavement. You can be able to make these you know, green stripes in the medians and parkways you know, with a, a sand profile in the EPIC system. Uh, this is an application where we just did gravel uh, to capture at the Nevada Department of Transportation headquarters in Carson City, Nevada. Uh, so along the entire perimeter of their site, uh, they installed these pads with EPIC that are filled with gravel and then a, a very you know, porous open grid paper on top. So all the maintenance facilities, all the crankcase strippings from the uh, cars, you know, the, the sediments, it all gets filtered uh, you know, through this system uh, along the perimeter. Uh, the oils in particular were of concern to the EPA. And uh, what was we're able to do is uh, the uh, hydrocarbons from the oils, you know, they, uh, they float on top of water since they're less dense. And so what happens is, is that the interface to the chamber, the yellow line, is lower than the operating line, which is the blue line. That's the invert of the two inch connector. So because you know, the oils float, they get captured in this gravel area above the chamber. And you now have less oils and hydrocarbons contributing into the final drain, you know, from the system. So those uh, you know, hydrocarbons can then be broken down by micro microbiological degradation. Blah, blah, blah. Say that five times fast. Um, but it's you know, it's the bacteria and the microbes. They exist naturally. I mean, you can add them to the profile too. But they eat the oil. They they break it down and back to CO two and water. And that's a part of how the BP oil spill ended up not being as bad a catastrophe as they thought. Is that many of these microbes were eating the hydrocarbons and breaking them down. It's like a, like a coral reef. Uh, City of Los Angeles has uh, spec, not by name, but by practice, the EPIC system uh, in its LID handbook. Uh, this is a similar practice that I think uh, many other urban areas can be able to uh, mimic. They've called it capture and use. Uh, it's right there on, I think, page 46 or so of their design manual. Um, also, we're, we're consulting with the City of LA to help be able to use the system as a capture and use method for the medians and parkways to where it could be a a shallow type of catch basin to where the street sweeper can be able to maintain it so you don't have to dig it out as the street sweeper comes by it'll suck up the, you know, the bottle caps the sediments that are gathered in the storm grate but then the excess water can then travel and have an observation vault 
to then be able to be you know, reused in the parkways and medians after it's captured. Uh, and then if you, you know, really have the desire to be sustainable, you can then be able to have storage systems also underneath the parkways and medians. So now you can have a sustainable urban system that can be able to manage stormwater, clean it up, hang on to some of it, and then reuse it you know, for landscape. But excess can still be able to drain out and connect to the uh, existing stormwater infrastructure. But it's clean water that you're draining away. It's just a matter of you know creating a new water resource. So if you look at the uh, the edge of pavements with these types of designs, with the epic chambers and and the different storage underneath, now you can be able to have a, a, a new type of uh, reservoir system. Uh, let's see, uh, similar to this. So you know with lining that system, we assume that you know the chambers might leak at some point, but now we can be able to keep every drop is sustainable. And these uh, Triton chambers, for example, yeah, there's. There's Brentwood, there's you know, Rainstore 3, there's you know, ADS, Storm Trap, Storm Trap or the big oh. concrete. So there's lots of different storage options available, but Epic is the key to pre-filtering any of those storage before you put it in. Um, this next video is a uh, video from, um, I think it was a car chase in Florida. It's just our, our enunciation of uh, what occurs on the, on the edges of roads. Oh, I hope it plays. It's such a great video. Anyway, it's, it's a car, he hits a ditch, he goes flying airborne, I can send it to you, it's not seeming to be working here, but the moral of the story is ditches love cars. And <laughs> what we are proposing is a new type of system along the edges of our roads that we can be able to you know, market to departments of transportation, and you know, Caltrans as well there too, down in the L.A., to where you, know, you don't need the ditch if you're using these types of systems. So if you have uh, an edge of road system, you, know, you can be able to filter and manage and still you know, convey the stormwater along the road right of way. But now you've got a new water resource. You've got a whole new reservoir system that can be applied. Uh, if you look at the worst case scenario outside Las Vegas, they get maybe four inches of rain a year. That 90 mile stretch, the 60 mile stretch is missing out of 92 million gallons of water a year. That for free, just you know, maybe irrigates a few sagebrush and evaporates and becomes, you know, rain in Boston. Yeah, and you can amortize that because it'll be you know, good for a lifetime. You start adding up the numbers, and we really can have a whole new reservoir system in the right of way of our roads. Uh, the first acre foot, you get in your first inch of rainfall in a mile. You know, it really adds up. You look at all the roads in the driest state here in Nevada. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, uh, seven inches annually. You add up all the roads, it's about 85,000 miles of roads. It's 600,000 acre feet a year. I think it's about half the size of Shasta Lake in Northern California. That right now is wasted and, 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 and not being resourced, not being used. So the last quick thing I wanted to touch base on is uh, agricultural applications. This is also a big you know, marketing strategy for East and West Coast because uh, it's not just landscapes you can grow it, it's food. Yeah, so. Uh, these are some of the tests that were done in the Middle East, uh, where it's the most extreme growing conditions. So you can be able to see the, the building, the background is reference. Uh, in this case, you know, we're recirculating from these inlet vaults, and it comes across and recirculates back. Uh, there's that same building right there as they're you know, growing these different leafy greens and, and different vegetables in the system. They, they tested many different systems, and they found that the water use was you know, two liters per square meter per day, which I think was 70% less than their drip system averages. The drip was 12. 12 liters is their trip. <laughs> so, yeah, we were 10 liters less per square meter. This is a, a, a greenhouse that was uh, retrofitted as well, too, uh, with kind of a row-type irrigation that they filled, you know, with the, the red dune sand planted 700 cucumbers. And then those cucumbers are, here's the growth, uh, never irrigated from the surface. And uh, here's the final growth. That's my friend Ahem uh, from Syria there. Uh, we were able to get 300% the crop growth using 70% less water, and I think it was 30% less fertilizer. Uh, so here's a comparison. The Epic is on the right. Uh, the state-of-the-art drip systems on the left, they were really trying to beat us, and they couldn't. Uh, and you can be able to see the difference in the plants as well, too. So it's that, you know, that afro root I was referring to early in the presentation, how the, the root system is so much stronger in a, in a sand profile, you can, in fact, yield more food uh, you know, from this system using less water. Half the water, twice the plant, like I said. And that's an understatement because in this case, it was 300% the, the plant growth. Uh, they also did some tests for the sprinklers there, too. This is just getting to the final bits of the system uh, compared to Epic, and the adjoining results were 78% you know, less water in that extreme 130-degree you know, climate sometimes. Uh, so it's you know, it's a 100% efficient system. Uh, another application that you can be able to consider, uh, especially for you guys down there at EPD in L.A., is that the air conditioner condensation 
is a water source. <laughs> Uh, in, in Dubai, it creates an excess of 5,000 gallons a day in some of these high-rise buildings. And you know, many of the projects that are going into the ground now in L.A. are connecting the air conditioner condensation to the roof downspouts that connect to the EPIC system. Because during the hottest parts of the summer, the air conditioners are working the hardest. And that helps give us a little extra boost of those extra precious drops that you know, help irrigate. Uh, this is another one that is off air conditioner only. So, I mean, you, know, you can be able to do it. It has been done. Uh, the most exciting aspect that I would really like to see move further around the world is saltwater irrigation. We've done it successfully. Uh, it can be done with uh, propagating the local uh, salt-tolerant plants. There's over 72 different salt-tolerant plants around the world, uh, from post-pollen grass like this to mangrove trees, you know, different flowering shrubs and, and flowers and such. But there's no salt buildup because as the system recirculates through the system, uh, the excess salts that are extracted uh, from the plant, they're able to dissolve back into the saturated zone and drain back out the sea. And uh, we did this test, you know, there in the Persian Gulf where it's the most saline tolerant, uh, 5% uh, compared to other, what's the? 3%. 3% in most of the other oceans. So uh, we actually had to put this fence up uh, around the area because the, the gazelle that graze along the beach uh, were preferring our salt plot. I think it's kind of like a Lay's potato chip. They couldn't have just one. They kept eating our grass, so we have to keep them out. So. Um, but that's more or less uh, our philosophy, is that instead of depending on you know, taking water from ground flows or aqueducts that bring water from the north down to the south, we can be sustainable from the precipitation alone. The models have shown it. You know, we've got projects in for over a decade that have demonstrated that if you store enough water on site, you can reuse it on site and, and balance nature. So fresh water is constant. It's just distribution is a problem. Everyone's going to have a drought at some point, but with using this technology, it can make it that much more versatile. And, and the way that we've spread out uh, the distribution of the technology is similar to mimicking the EPA. So we have these 10 regions uh, that are more or less, so we have you know, uh, LID incorporated down here in region nine, you know, having in California you know, in the Southwest. Uh, I believe Aquarius is looking here at you know, Region 3. So as you know, the company grows and expands, these are the 10 regions of focus because these are more or less their own independent ecosystems and climates as well there too. So uh, that's the presentation in, in a nutshell, and we're uh, open to any questions uh, that anyone has you know, from what they've seen here and how we can be able to help. I think a, a good thing to go to next, too, is just to show on the website here uh, how there's lots of features that you can be able to find on the website. And feel free to interrupt me if there's any questions that come through. Or you know, Let me just check the chat here. EPD is online, sound but no microphone. So, yeah, EPD, feel free to type anything in the chat room or email me any questions as well that have come up. Um, but on our website here at uh, EpicTWS.com, which points to ECS-Green.com for now. <clears throat> uh, there's many different things. How do we test the liner during installation? Well, we, we before the liner is rolled out, we make sure that you know, the, the subgrade is absolutely laser level, you know, that half-inch tolerance, uh, you know, 90% proctor density. Uh, the liner itself, it's a 45 mil liner, so it, it should be relatively impervious. Uh, we try to take precautions of uh, making sure there's no sharp rocks or anything protruding underneath. Uh, if there is in that case, if you're installing over such things, you can put a geofabric out first before you lay out the liner. Uh, as you're installing the liner, you wouldn't want to have you know, no smoking allowed. Uh, you know, it, it, it does get penetrated from like a sharp uh, object or sharp knife. Uh, there are patches that you can be able to patch the liner with as well, too. Uh, see me, uh, so during installation, it's, it's just best to you know, keep track and, and, and observe the liner as you're installing it, making sure that there's, uh, you know, there's no uh, unwanted penetrations. And all the penetrations that do exist from the pipes are sealed with a conduit flashing. Uh, I can... That spec sheet is available through Firestone, and I can send that to you guys there too. Yeah, le leakage concern is minimal because it's not a pressurized system. So even if you have a theoretical pinhole, you really have probably clay soils underneath, 
and uh, a sand profile above it that squeezes that hole into a very minimal leakage, even if it's a pinhole. I, I have made solicitation emails that, that we send out to architects and engineers to get them to attend the webinar. Um, I can be able to provide that to you guys. What our intent here is, is to do a webinar similar to this on a quarterly basis. So every three months, we can then direct you know, new clients and, and new uh, architects and engineers as well, too, uh, to you know, learn about the system. So that's what we want to be able to coordinate with you guys uh, to where we can be able to you know, host these on a quarterly basis you know, for, you know, with your efforts. And I can be able to get you some of the flyers and uh, your solicitation material uh, to, be able to, you know, to be able to do that. We'd be happy to do that. Uh, also here, if you're ever showing someone, you know, seeing it for the first time on the home page, you know, just down a little bit, you know, from, from the top screen here is, I call it the Lab Coat Series. And these are four videos. And we got Jonas, we recorded him in a lab coat. Uh, explaining, you know, how the slitted pipe, you know, does not work. And we can, you know, I'll just hit play real quick. We'll see how, it's only like a few oh, seconds. My name is Jonas Shapila. I invented what we call the epic pipe. So when you have sand, which is totally dry or totally wet, it's going to flow like water, and very small particles are going to infiltrate the pipe. So here's my slitted pipe with a layer of stone around it. But if you put it in an environment that is sandy, look what happens at high speed. The sand particles like Pachinko will find the smallest opening and start infiltrating the pipe. See, that, that's the kind of pipe that everyone knows about, and that's what we can be able to replace. So ultimately, we are looking to be the next that's French drain. common in ordinary pipe. Now, I mentioned that the particle has to be... And you can be able to watch all these on your, on your own time there, too, but you know, I highly recommend it only takes about five minutes to see them all. Uh, but that's the lab coat series you know, here on the website. There's also this video here that's a 3D animation that shows how Epic works. So this is a very good way to you know, introduce people to the system as well, too. Um, yeah, here's you know, an article about you know, the greenhouse that we installed there. Uh, there's a media section with the different articles. Um, but most importantly, down here at the bottom of the site is this map. And this map is pretty cool. I've been spending a lot of time on it. There's still you know, some more work to do. But if you click on the pins of the map, uh, it'll show you the different installations and a little you know, description about them. You can be able to see some of the different pictures and stuff uh, of you know, what these installations uh, are doing. So I think that's a real fun way uh, to be able to you know, kind of tour uh, all the installations that Epic has done over the years. Uh, I think we've even got you know, the James Hunter Park in here, too. Let's see here. Click that one. Now, yeah, I don't have. I need. I need pictures of that one. <laughs> I got to put pictures up for that one. But you know, we still have. You'll know, have the installation date, how how large it is. You know, so you can be able to you know see some of the different installs that have that have taken place. Uh, yeah, here it is. And I'll get pictures of James Hunter next time I'm down there. Yeah, that'd be great to get an updated picture. But I mean, we've got some of the ones I think from install and and on our uh, sites under the. Um, Let's see here. I think it's under about. I want to change that about to media, but yeah, we have a media section here, and yeah, there's a couple of James Hunter Park, uh, you know, videos and, and interviews and media there too. So we got you know, the media section. The install cost per square foot. Uh, LID Incorporated would be the best answer for that, uh, but the parts themselves for Epic uh, are about you know, two to three dollars. You know, you know, usually under three bucks, and that's for you know, the liner, the pipes, the in a chamber, then you have the cost of the sand. You know that varies between you know three to six bucks per square foot, and then the cost of installation. I think the average costs that uh, Mario's been doing for these small urban planters, uh, completely installed, have averaged somewhere between you know fifteen to twenty-three dollars per square foot. Uh, a lot of this is depending on you know access and uh, you know the uh, you know, the size and that sort of thing. Larger uh, fields, uh, like the ones also was done at six. Yeah, that, that was over ten years ago, though, too. But yeah, we yeah. we basically we've seen the price per square foot go vary anywhere from you know six or seven bucks per square foot up to seventy. 
uh, you know, given if it's like a very That's tall something. skyscraper where they have to use a crane to bring the sand up or something like that. But I think uh, for you know, for areas above 10,000 feet, typically the price is falling somewhere between 10 and $12 a foot installed. And for smaller planters below 10,000 square feet, it's, you know, a little bit more, you know, getting up to almost 20 bucks a foot there. So that's, um, you know, on a per project basis. Uh, the other fun thing is the, uh, you know, any information that you need on the resources here, we've got tons of white papers and information. Uh, the IECA paper is great. Uh, road filter dynamics. Uh, th this is where we did that in Lake Tahoe. And, and that kind of you know, shows the same model that we're working on, like I said, that I think could be replicated in all cities is where at the bottom of that document, we are getting ratings that we, I'll show you that we have a, a, a test rating for the sports field up to 10,000 pounds. And we're in the process of getting the uh, H20 rating for 40,000 pounds. So we'll be putting that on the website as soon as that test is completed uh, this spring or early summer. Uh, but here you can be able to see how you know, the street edge of pavement is then you know, captured in the catch basin with you know, the, uh, the grate, and then it can convert to the you know, median on the, on the other side. Um, close out of that. If you scroll down here under our spec sheets, uh, you can be able to see here's our chamber loading test that was uh, done. That shows you know, the, uh, uh, how we took the, you know, the 10,000 pounds. This is mostly for sports field you know, reasons, that sort of thing. But we'll get the H20 stuff up there soon. Uh, we've got the spec sheets uh, for you know, the different vaults and, and the, the chamber spec sheets here. Um, we do have to get uh, Aquarius. Uh, you guys got to get up here into the uh, certified contractors. We'll uh, be working on that and the regional distributor. And then uh, AutoCAD details are also here on the site uh, listed as well. And if you need to show even a whole other presentation, we've got one that we did to the American Society of Civil Engineers here by NDOT. So this is it's a whole you know hour long presentation similar to what you just went through. So that's here on the website. You can be able to stream that any time. But I did record this uh, presentation we did here, so we uh, will you know, get that copy there to you guys as well. Um, last but not least, the blog section is uh, what I try to keep most up to date on what we're doing, different meetings that we were attending, and speeches that we're doing. Uh, so this has lots of great information. This is that uh, family grows at the Braywater. This is the First gray water system, I think EPD installed uh, there in Santa Monica with Andy Lauer. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure we mentioned you guys here too. If we, I try to link everybody involved in these projects, so let me see here. Growing up, yeah, there's Andy Lauer's website. There's his kids and um, stringent savings. Yeah, we talk about that different stuff. Show the install pictures, you know. Gray water consultant service. That's right, at Malibu, too. That's right. I think I'm, you guys have mentioned there. Yeah, okay, that's Andy's website there. I know I have you guys linked somewhere. If it's not on this blog, it's on the other one. But I thought, yeah, there you go. There it is, EPD. See? Without asking, I hope it's okay. I'm, I'm advertising you guys, too, right from our blog there. So, Greenest Lawn and Point Doom. Okay. <laughs> I'll bet they are. That would be uh, that would be this lawn right here. So uh, we called it cliff erosion control. There, there's the greenest lawn on Point Doom, and that was also the coolest installation too, because you could watch like the whales swim by while we were installing. And I believe they were able to triple the size of their turf area because they're using Epic. It's helping uh, the cliff erosion, and this is real good uh, sequence. Uh, I think uh, Aquarius, you guys could benefit from this as well too, because we show. You know, the, the leveling, uh, you know, using the transit, laying out the liner, uh, installing the system all through the phases. And there's lots of great pictures here and through the whole process of, you know, the epic installation. So this is the, uh, you know, there's the cliff that we're helping protect. <laughs> and I think you can actually, you can scroll through all these like a slideshow kind of thing, too. So we're, like I said, trying to add a lot, you know, to the website, you know, constantly. So any... You know, pictures of installations that you have, uh, any information for projects that have been done, I'd be happy to put them up here on the blog and, and, and uh, you know, keep the content rolling because that's what, you know, adds to the, you know, the Google searches and then helping get us you know, greater exposure as we you know, grow the company and, and build to this, uh, this co-op of all of us working together with this, you know, fantastic business opportunity. So 
um, yeah, like I said, keep me posted on um, on what you can be able to send our way there. So, so the blog has lots of great information. You know, it's a great place to peruse through and, and look through there. Oh, and uh, another cool feature. <laughs> Once again, here in the blog, on the uh, DaVinci, we've got this uh, great thing where we can be able to show you know, the before and after you know, with this neat uh, scrolling effect. I think it's called a, it's a 2020 plugin. So that's a neat thing to show clients there as well, too, you know, that helps them visualize. Also, uh, there's a nice video here, this, uh, this Paradise Field. Um, our, our horn actually went and got a drone. And they filmed uh, the install from the air. And so it's a really nice video that kind of shows the process there, too. That's the old field that they ripped up and tore up. So they excavated down the, you know, the 16 inches. Got it all laser level with their graders. They got their nice piano music and stuff. And now they're start, starting to install Epic. So there you can be able to see the liners rolled out, the chambers being placed on the liner. Now they're starting to connect them with the, the connectors and put the sandbags on top to hold them in place. And you can see that they used the 30-foot cells here, so there's five rows per cell. So each cell is about 28 feet wide. And they seam them in the middle with the seam tape. So there they are loading into the hopper. You can see a little drone shadow there. <laughs> and now it's the sand fill with the, with the telebelt system. So they swing that out, spread that out. They wet the sand down for, for compaction. Working on the side work there too. There's really red uh, soils there. there lots of red clay in the area. Yeah, part of why that the field was not draining until they put the epic in. So, you know, as you can see, we we have a real we have a real big team here. There's the finished field there, you know. But yeah, I think we have a, a good website developing here. We have you know, good partners that you know many of which are on the online with us right now, and uh, you know really appreciate you guys you know being part of it, and, and look forward to moving forward with you here as we you know build this. This collective to help you know the water management of the future, and I think we really have a win-win product that can uh, really be a great business opportunity for everyone to you know go make good money and and, uh, and do it with pride, you know, because we're it's not like we're you know you're pillaging and taking from the earth, we're giving back, we're helping clean things up and make things right, you know, so it's it's, it's a feel-good uh, kind of marketing you know as well. So I really appreciate you guys attending. Is there any other questions I can answer? I want to go ahead and stop the recording for now here. I think we got enough content to be able to forward on. I think I